today's lesson is going to be focusing on what's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And actually, we've been doing this the whole time. Okay? You just didn't realize it. So today basically serves as a review to everything we've been talking about in 3.4 and 3.5. The first example asks for us to write the polynomial given the zeros. You've already been doing this when we were factoring using synthetic division. Remember, once we've tested and found a root, we would write a binomial, essentially changing the signs. So when I go here, I would write binomials, but have to change the sign, so that way I'd get the solution that I want. So if I want a solution of negative 2, I need to put x plus plus 2. If I want a solution of positive 2, I need to put x minus 2. If I want a solution of positive 4, I need to put x minus 4. Now if I'm going to write the polynomial function, unfortunately, yes, we do have to go ahead and multiply all of that out. But again, you've already learned this earlier in chapter 3, which is multiplying polynomials. So when you're doing this, just take it one step at a time. The first thing that you should do is multiply these two together. So x times x is x squared. x times a negative 2 is a negative 2x. Two, 2 times x is 2x. Two, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Now I had some people go ahead and once they do this, start using the arrow method once again. It'll work, that's fine, but honestly, it would be easier if you combine like terms first. So when I combine like terms, it just so happens that these two cancel, giving me x squared minus 4 times x minus 4. Again, that just makes it easier on myself. So I'm going to do arrow method once again, and that gives me x cubed minus 4x squared minus 4x plus 16. That is my polynomial that will have the three zeros that I wanted. Go ahead and pause the video and try uh, this next example. Feel free to pause the video and check all of your work before moving on. We are now going to be discussing the fundamental theorem of algebra. And like I said, we've already been discussing this. Essentially what the fundamental theorem says is that um, if you have a degree larger than 1, then you will have um, at least one zero, And that zero may be a complex number, which we'll see today. Um, but remember, we've been looking at the degrees and determining, yes, there will be that many zeros. It doesn't mean we're going to have that many x-intercepts, but we will have, in this case, example 2a, 11 solutions. And example 2b, if it's in factored form, we can still tell the number of solu solutions by looking at the degree. So 1, 1, 3, 1. Just add those together. 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 gives me 6. So once again, the fundamental theorem of algebra just says if there's a degree greater than or equal to 1, it's going to have at least one solution. And it may be a complex number, or it may be a repeated uh, root, which we've seen before when talking about multiplicity. Let's find all roots of this polynomial function right here. The first thing that I'm going to have to do is list out all of the possible roots using rational root theorem. That's in our 3.5 video. So if you need to go back and look at that, you're welcome to. Rational root theorem says that we're going to have plus or minus the factors of our constant, so in this case plus or minus the factors of 20, 
over plus or minus the factors of our leading coefficient. So in this case, our leading coefficient is 1. Putting a 1, oops, let me scoot over so you can see it, there. It's nice that it's just over plus or minus 1, so that means I can just write all whole, no all whole numbers for my possible zeros, which are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 20, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 5. So these are all of my possible zeros, but it doesn't mean that all of them work. Going back over here at my function, I see that I started off with a degree of 4, which means that I'm going to have four zeros. Let's start testing them. I like to do the smaller numbers, as I mentioned before, so I'm just going to start with 1. When doing synthetic division, you need to check that it's written in standard form with placeholders. And it looks pretty good, so I'm going to put a 1, 4, negative 1, 16, and negative 20, and start synthetic division. Remember, the goal is we should have a remainder of 0. If it doesn't have a remainder of 0, it is not a factor. So bring down the 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 4 plus 1 is 5, 5 times 1 is 5, add that together I get 4, 4 times 1 is 4, add that together I get 20, multiply by 1 I get 20, and I do in this case get a remainder of 0. So now that I have that remainder of 0, I can write my factored form. The first parentheses will be a binomial where I would get a solution of 1. Think back to example 1, what we were doing here. So if I want a solution of a positive 1, I need to write x minus 1. And then in parentheses, I would write my new um, coefficients with one degree less than what we started with, meaning I have 1x cubed plus 5x squared plus 4x plus 20. If it were possible to do factoring by grouping, then you're welcome to do that. So let's see, I have um, x squared that I could pull out, so that's x squared times x plus 5, plus 4 times x plus 5. So hey, you know what? Factoring by grouping does work here. We can go ahead, and like I was saying, pull out a GCF of x squared, which gives me x plus 5, and then pull out a positive 4 here with my last two terms, giving me x plus 5. So that gives me x minus 1 times x plus 5 times x squared plus 4. I do want to mention, if I would not have been able to factor by grouping, I would have had to do synthetic division once again. Now, this is set equal to 0, right? Meaning that... Um, I need to set each binomial equal to 0. x minus 1 equal to 0 gives me x equals 1. x plus 5 equal to 0 gives me negative 5. x squared plus 4 equals 0. This is what I want to talk about. I could not have written this as a difference of two squares. The reason why is because of that plus sign, right? We need it to be able to cancel out to a 0 um, x, and, and that just doesn't happen here. So x squared minus 4 does not factor, but that doesn't mean that we can't have any solutions from this. When I set x squared plus 4 equal to 0, I would solve for x. Subtract 4 from each side, I get x squared equals negative 4. And then to get the x by itself, I take the square root of each side. Remember, when you take the square root, you must put plus or minus. So I have plus or minus the square root of negative 4. This is not an acceptable answer. The first thing that I'm going to do is rewrite it as plus or minus the square root of 4 i. I take that negative root and I move it into, onto the outside. 
because remember the square root of a negative 1 is i. Square root of 4 could be simplified to plus or minus 2i. So I do have four zeros, just like how I said I would. One, negative five, a positive two i, and a negative two i. So are all of my zeros showing up here? Not quite, right? The rational root theorem shows us all of the possible real solutions. So my real solutions of 1 and negative 5 are listed. My imaginary solutions are not. Just wanted to point that out. All right, guys, so I pulled up Desmos and plugged in my equation. I just wanted to show you how having imaginary roots would impact our graph. So we did say we had real solutions of 1 and negative 5, which we can see as x-intercepts. That's it. Okay, even though we had four zeros, those two imaginary numbers don't show up on the x-axis. So I just have two x-intercepts. They both had a multiplicity of 1, so I see that they both are passing through. And if I zoom out, remember this was... Um, an x to the fourth power, so it was a quartic function, showing I do have same n behavior as well. Okay. Moving on to example four, I actually don't need to use rational root theorem here um, because I don't need to use synthetic division. We only need to use synthetic division when factoring doesn't work. However, this is a difference of two squares. So I just wanted to remind you of that, okay? If we can factor, let's do it. What squared would give me x to the fourth power? Well, that would be x squared. What squared would give me 81? Well, that's nine. So I can rewrite this as x squared plus nine times x squared minus nine. We always wanna factor as far as we possibly um, can. So, x squared plus 9 is not factorable, and that's because of that positive right there. So I need to keep that. The x squared minus 9 can be factored further because once again, we have a difference of two squares. a would be x and b would be 3. So it's x plus 3 and x minus 3. Now that we've factored as far as we can go, let's set each equal to zero. X squared plus nine equals zero. When I solve, I get X squared equals negative nine. Take the square root of each side, and remember when we take that square root, we must put a plus or minus, and then we have square root of negative nine. Remember the square root of a negative one is I, and the square root of 9 is 3, so really this is plus or minus 3i. If I'm thinking about my zeros or my solutions or my roots, I have 3i and negative 3i so far. Because it was a degree of 4, I know I have two more. So I'm setting each of these equal to 0, I get a negative 3 and a positive 3. Now, if I'm thinking about the graph, my real solutions will appear, but my imaginary will not. And because it has a multiplicity of 1, they're each going to pass through. Also, because the degree was 4, which is an even power, I know it should have the same end behavior. I went to Desmos, plugged in my equation. Here are my x-intercepts, positive 3 and negative 3. Like I said we'd have, it's passing through. And if I zoom out, you can see we do have the same end behavior. Please watch part 2 for example 5 and the try problem.